Five Blemishes Missing from My History as a Dreaded Atheist by Krishna's Mercy Yadyad vibhutimat sattvam shrimadur jitmeva va tatt deva va gachatvam mam tejosha sambhavam Quote, Know that all beautiful, glorious, and mighty creations spring from but a spark of my splendor. Lord Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, 1041. One Drugs Can you answer me something? Why do so many people within your faith come from a background of heavy drug use? This story is actually not exclusive to your faith. I believe others refer to it as their testimony. It was when they converted, so to speak. They never thought of God previously. It was only after they indulged to the extent of reaching the brink of death, of losing everything, that they decided to turn to the heavens. It was a miraculous change, you see. They went from the bottom to the top. They are sober now. They can speak to others. They can share the light as they have seen it. They can admonish others standing high atop their perch looking down at everyone else. All right, that is wonderful. I applaud you for getting things together, but what about people like me? I have never done drugs. I never even thought about them. I am responsible. I am not self-indulgent. What does your religion have to offer me that I don't already know? Why are the drug addicts welcomed in your institution, but people like me are mocked and ridiculed? We are supposedly the sinners, doomed forever in the afterlife, while the former addicts are completely absolved. How does that make sense? To alcohol. Can you answer me something? Why do so many of your followers come from a background of heavy drinking? I am not talking about your odd toast or two at a wedding reception. This is not just sitting in a leather chair at an exclusive club, smoking cigars, wearing tweed jackets, and discussing the latest theatrical production over a glass of brandy. I am talking heavy drinking, to the point that they need therapy. They have to check into a rehab clinic. They cannot control themselves. They are so messed up that friends and family have abandoned them. You see, that is the impetus for the turnaround. They feel all alone, except the hand of God grabs them by the shoulder. That hand lifts them up, to the point that they can now share their testimony with others. What about people like me? I have never had a drink in my life. I have no interest in it. Not that I am keeping score or competing with others. I could drink a beer and not feel guilty about it. I can control myself. Is that the only way your people can straighten up? You have to read a sacred book in order to quit binge drinking? And people like me are supposedly the fallen ones. How does that make sense? 3. Abuse Can you answer me something? Why are so many of your leaders abusive to a criminal extent? You know exactly what I am talking about. The things they have done to children could fill the pages of the most salacious fictional novels. Except this actually happened in real life with no repercussions of which to speak. Sure, the leaders got a slap on the wrist, but they still operate on the periphery. They haven't lost any followers. They are absolved of all sinful reaction, you see, due precisely to their allegiance to the institution. They are perpetually saved, since they are actually saintly in nature. Those children were merely mistaken into feeling terrorized and tortured. Those children were only getting what was due to them in the system of karma. That is the rationalization we hear. What about people like me? I may not be perfect, but I am smart enough to know not to beat children, especially the kids of other parents. I might yell and scream on occasion. I might admonish. I might write a strongly worded letter or two, but I have never come close to breaking the law. Why are the perpetrators welcomed with open arms in your institution, while people like me are considered lowly and fallen? Heaven forbid I have a beer or two. I need it after hearing about the unspeakable things your leaders have done. For Theft Can you answer me something? Why is it that so many of the leaders in your institution have been caught stealing? This is not from their past either. This is after they entered the supposedly divine path. They changed their clothes, 
their name, and where they lived. They were given respect to the highest levels, to the point that they were put in charge of running valuable buildings. Well, many of those buildings are no more. The leaders sold the properties and ran off with the money. Aren't they so nice? What a sense of charity. Embezzlement much? We should really sing their glories day after day. How else would we know the value of what we have if not for the people illegally taking things away? I am being sarcastic, of course. Where do people like me fit in? I am not religious. I do not have affiliation with any particular sect. I also have never committed grand larceny. I have not embezzled funds like many of your esteemed gurus have. Why are they welcomed and worshipped while people like me are tossed aside, considering impure for living on the fringes? 5. Mistreating Women Can you answer me something? Why do your leaders hate women so much? I am talking about more than just their words. They have been so harsh and cruel with people who have committed no wrong. These women are discriminated against because of the circumstances related to birth. Don't get me wrong. I am well aware of the differences between men and women. I understand that it is a long-standing tradition for men to complain about women, to joke about how they are so emotional, how they can manipulate through cunning means, how they cannot be trusted, etc. I am not naive to basic human tendencies. At the same time, I would never speak these horrible words directly to a woman. Neither would I speak that way to anyone. You judge on character. I have never taken a class on this subject. How come your people don't know this? They are supposedly religious. They are supposed to be smarter than everyone else. Why are such people leading your institution, while people like me are considered contaminated? The above arguments should be considered and deliberated upon. If everyone affiliated with a particular brand of spirituality has a checkered past, if they only were saved after hitting rock bottom, what about those who have lived in an overall clean manner? Why should those who are not in distress show interest in spiritual life? They do not necessarily need to get rid of vices or addictions. They are doing fine at the moment. How has being a non-believer, an atheist, an agnostic, or any other appropriate term negatively impacted them? The truth is that with a genuine appeal towards Dharma, through an authorized tradition, every person has something to gain. It is said by Sri Krishna that the devotees should not worry about losing. Krishna will maintain what they have. He will also bring to them whatever they lack. Ananyash chintayantoma Ye jana pariyupasate Tesha nityabhiyuktanam Yogakshemam vahamya aham Quote, but those who worship me with devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack and preserve what they have. Lord Krishna, Bhagavad Gita, 9.22 Every person, whether they lack or not, has a tendency to appreciate. On the other side of criticism is appreciation. If I have a negative view of people aligned with organized religion— then I will appreciate those who are not aligned. If I cannot stand people of a certain behavior, then I will appreciate those who are outside of that circle. The appeal with the Bhakti Yoga tradition, which is a way to further define the concept of Dharma, is to appreciate on the grandest scale. Take whatever it is that we already appreciate. The sunshine, the beautiful snow of winter, the love and care offered by parents, the latest technology which pushes the boundaries of efficiency, the preferred beverage or that video game we love to play. We should understand that there is a single source. It is like the strength of man. The individual is Purusha. Their ability is known as Paurusham. Strength is one aspect of that ability, and if we appreciate strength, we should know that the source of strength is the same in every individual. Shri Prahradu Vach, Na Kevalam Me Bhavatash Cha Rajan, Savai Balam Balinam Cha Pare Sham, Pare Vare Me Sthir Jangama Ye, Brahma Dayo Yen Vasham Pranita. 
Quote, Pralada Maharaja said, My dear king, the source of my strength of which you are asking is also the source of yours. Indeed, the original source of all kinds of strength is one. He is not only your strength or mine, but the only strength for everyone. Without him, no one can get any strength. Whether moving or not moving, superior or inferior, everyone, including Lord Brahma, is controlled by the strength of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam 7.87 There is one source of everything. We can try to conceive of a concept known as everything. The Sanskrit word jagat might correspond with this concept. That jagat represents but a spark of the splendor, tejas, of the original source. Genuine religion is for constantly appreciating that source, such that other appreciations automatically follow in the manner of a waterfall. Such appreciation is timeless in nature and without end, Ananta. Thus, every person has sufficient justification for following dharma, whether they are in the club or out, whether they have fallen to the depths of destitution or have been walking the straight edge since birth. In Closing Never a single drink or towards drugs to think. Never a female berated or larceny scheme created. But such people celebrated and more, what purpose your institution for? Appreciation universal tendency said, bhakti towards single source led.